To quote Susan Bright from her book Art Photography Now, contemporary photography is the magpie of all artistic mediums, cherry picking styles and theories from the other arts and turning them into something resolutely its own. At the end of the last lecture series, we looked at how contemporary photography is an amalgam of disciplines, influences, and practice, one that has broken traditional boundaries and expanded the field to surprising degrees. The genre of photography that's probably the most synonymous with contemporary practice is narrative photography. At its most basic definition, narrative photography is staged photography that relies on narrative for its reading and incorporates elements of fantasy, artifice, and make-believe in the production of it. With narrative photography, the photographer is the auteur or director, carefully orchestrating all of the elements of one particular shot, and the resulting image is generally a one-off, meant to exist as a singular, all-encompassing moment. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the evolution of narrative photography, specifically about how it evolved from the conceptual photography we discussed in the previous lecture, and how contemporary artist photographers are exploring the idea of narrative photography today. But before I do that, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about what narrative and narrative structure is. For your assignment in this module, you'll be using, using narrative structure to help you conceptualize your images and plan your shots, so it's important to understand how it works. If you've studied literature or filmmaking, this may be old news, and if so, maybe this will be a short refresher. But if you're new to the concept, then stay tuned and pay attention. You'll need this moving forward. The term narrative suggests a story and implies movement. Narrative photography relies upon the same narrative elements that we see in literature, theater, and film. There are five key narrative elements to keep in mind as you're conceptualizing your own narrative or story, and understanding and using them not only helps you conceptualize your own work, but also helps you interpret narrative work by other artists. These are plot, setting, character, point of view, and theme. In thinking through your idea, you need to develop all of these elements thoroughly in order to get the execution of your idea or the shot itself just right. The plot is the action of the narrative, and it's comprised of multiple elements that steer the action in a story arc that makes the narrative flow. The exposition is the introduction of the action. Here you introduce your characters, you provide any necessary background, and you establish the setting. Then you introduce rising action or conflict. These are the major events of the story that occur between the introduction and the climax, and there are traditionally two types of conflict. Internal, which is man versus self, and external, man versus man, man versus nature, and man versus society. After you establish the conflict, you determine the climax or the turning point of the story, and this is where your audience is able to ask the question, what happens next? After the climax, you have the falling action when the story winds down to the final element, and then the resolution, or the conclusion. The setting is the time and location of the story. Where and when does the action of the story take place? Is there one setting, or are there multiple settings? Character describes both the main actors, the protagonists and antagonists of the story, and the type of people they are, their characteristics and their personality. The point of view is the angle from which you tell the story. And finally, the theme is the central message or moral of the story. The theme is what unifies all the other elements within the narrative, and this works both in the literary sense and visually, so keep that in mind as you conceptualize your own work. In narrative photography, not all of these elements are necessarily visible within the image itself. Clearly, if you have one single image, you can't really contain an entire story arc or multiple settings or an in-depth character study the way you could in a novel, a movie, or a multi-act play. But what's important to remember is that photographers who are concerned with narrative photography think about and use all of these elements as they're conceptualizing their work. And remember, the photograph is the result of the idea, not the thing itself. All right, now we can look at some art. My hope with this lecture is that you watch it once and then go back and revisit the work and the photographers I show you. As you do, see if you can decode the images by figuring out how each photographer has used narrative elements and narrative structure to construct the shot. Taking time to do so will help you in your own work, I promise. 
To understand how narrative photography evolved as a practice, we have to jump back briefly to the late 1960s and 70s and take a look at the legacy of conceptual photography. For most conceptual artists of those years, photography was a tool and not necessarily a medium unto itself. Conceptual artists like Bruce Nauman and John Baldessari used photography to document their larger art practice, and artists like Ed Ruscha used it to document an idea. In the case of his 26 gasoline stations, the idea is the banality and the repetition of American suburbia. On the face of it, these photographs seem to be documentary images, or worse, just mere snapshots. But what separates them, importantly, from documentary photographs is the fact that the subjects of the images have been set up or collated by the artist. Bruce Nauman planned out elaborate body paintings and used the camera to record them as a means of presenting them to an audience that wasn't necessarily present at the time of their creation. Ed Ruscha spent countless hours traveling Southern California's suburban sprawl to prove a point. And his photographs illustrate that. Conceptual artists rejected modernism, and their using photography to do so helped propel photography forward so that by the 1970s, photographer artists were creating things in their studio or organizing things in such a way expressly to be photographed. Instead of observing and recording the real world, these artist photographers constructed worlds, often challenging our perceptions about what is real and what is fiction. The legacy of conceptual art is that it gave photographers the opportunity and the authority to compose and craft images the way that artists did in other media. Photographers no longer had to work with extant subjects and forms, available light, or other forms of reality. Photographers were no longer limited to the role of witness. And with the fabrication of settings and objects, photographers had carte blanche to directly subvert photography as evidence of a certifiable truth. In the 1970s, the dominant issue of art photography was the right of photographers to create their own subject matter instead of reporting it, and the result was a rediscovery of an expressive photographic language that had been cast out and excluded by modernist thinking and practice. Robert Cumming was one of the first artists to make use of constructed subject matter for his photographs. A painter, sculptor, and printmaker in addition to being a photographer, Cumming photographed elaborate and highly conceptual drawings and constructions. John Divola explores landscapes by looking for what he calls an edge between the abstract and the specific. He's known for embellishing or intervening in sites of ruin and decay. With his famous Zuma project, which he began in 1977, he, quote, attempted to develop a practice in which there could be no distinction between the document and the original. He found these deserted houses in Zuma Beach, Malibu, and often covered the walls with graffiti or altered the environment surrounding them to exaggerate the ruin. For Divola, the resulting photographic images are remnants of the artistic process. David Leventhal is known for his full-scale studio-based tableau, which often featured children's toys photographed to look real. In his famous work, Hitler Moves East, which he photographed between 1972 and 1975 and wrote with Gary Trudeau, you can see how he captured his toy soldiers in such a way as to resemble documentary World War II photography. These images are so disturbing and surprising because they are almost believable. Sandy Skoglund is also famous for her large-scale tableau, which combine humor and craftsmanship. In her case, she constructs detailed, elaborate, surrealist sets or installation, fashioned specifically as a new reality for the camera. These sets, which take her months and months to complete, are handmade and defined by their highly saturated colors and sculptural objects. Joel Peter Witkin uses both tableau and photo manipulation to explore themes like death and corpses. His images are often throwbacks to the surrealist imagery of the 1930s, and the planning and the manipulation that go into them anticipated the digital manipulation that is so pervasive today. The self-conscious awareness that we live in a camera-based and camera-bound culture is an essential feature of the postmodernist photography that took us to the end of the 20th century. Many artist photographers working with narrative photography in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s embraced the visual language of popular culture, mass media, and film to tell their stories. Cindy Sherman is a definitive member of the Pictures Generation, which is a name given to a group of artists represented in a 2009 show at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that included Sherman, 
Barbara Kruger, and the next few artists we're going to take a look at. Her untitled film stills, shot between 1977 and 80, were groundbreaking works in which she manufactured a series of masks for herself using the conventions of the glossy publicity print that we looked at in our portrait lectures and narrative elements from film noir. For Sherman, this work is about unmasking, unmasking the tropes and the visual language of film noir, unmasking the idea of a woman as a depicted object, referring to the stereotypes of women in print media and film, and questioning the whole idea of a personal identity. Hers are self-portraits that deny the self. Herself is pieced together from film, TV, fashion, and advertising. Eileen Cowan, in her family docudrama series from 1980 to 1983, uses the visual language of soap operas, film stills, and romantic comedy scenes to depict careful arrangements of family situations, where every actor is given specific roles and emotions in a constructed setting, characterized by anxiety. Laurie Simmons has become well known for carefully staging situations, but using miniaturized representations of human beings in equally miniaturized environments. In the 70s, 80s, and 90s, she staged scenes with dolls, ventriloquist dummies, objects on legs, and people in order to reference domestic scenes. More recently, she's been exploring high-realistic sex dolls and avatars. For Simmons, the dolls are stand-ins for cultural models, allowing her to examine the feminine conventions of society and history and expose them for undermining society and repressing the role of women in it. The influence of film and cinema on contemporary constructed narrative or staged photography has been unmistakable. The language of film and how we engage with it is vital. Contemporary narrative photography borrows important elements from film, including pregnant pauses, the idea of mise-en-scene, which is where the audience arrives mid-scene and doesn't necessarily know what happened before or what will happen after that particular moment, dramatic lighting, and cinematic tropes in such a way that allows for parody or pastiche. Pastiche is a work of art that imitates another previously executed work of art. Most importantly, in staged photography, the artist's hand, or her direct control over the execution of the work, is apparent. Jeff Wall is a highly influential Canadian photographer who is known both for staging photographs after famous works of art and literature, and for photographic tableau against the backdrop of Vancouver's mix of urban decay, natural beauty, and industrial featurelessness. Hannah Starkey is a British photographer who specializes in staged settings of women in city environments. Collier Shore is an American photographer best known for her portraits of adolescents that blend photographic realism with elements of fiction and fantasy. She explores many themes in her work, history, nationality, and identity or gender issues. Some contemporary artists weave documentary issues and styles into their work, creating ambiguity between what is staged and what is real. In this kind of work, there's often an inherent tension, characterized by feelings of uncanny or impending doom. We, as the audience, experience a push and pull between the beautifully constructed image and fear or anxiety. Gregory Crudson works with staged tableau of American homes and small-town neighborhoods. He orchestrates each shot the way a film director would orchestrate a motion picture, scouring locations for the perfect location, employing dozens of actors and stage managers, and working with the same kind of production crew you'd see with a major film. Bill Henson is another contemporary photographer who explores the idea of duality with his tableau. Anthony Guacolia stages anxious situations in order to explore themes of androgyny, homosexuality, and child sexuality. Contemporary artists like Wacolia take the influence of film and cinema to an almost kitschy degree, producing images that involve the idea of a stage set with obvious actors, where we can see that the situation is fiction and there's no mistaking the reality as an artificial one. Tracy Moffat is an Australian photographer. Her Up in the Sky series from 1998 is a sequential narrative comprised of fantasy images of Australia's stolen generation, indigenous children separated from their families and relocated by the Australian government. 
Wang Qin Song is a Chinese photographer that explores a rapidly changing China and Chinese culture in a humorous way. And finally, to bring our discussion of broken boundaries full circle, we see contemporary photographers like the AES and F Collective, which is a group of four Russian artists, using digital processes free reign to produce grand visual narratives that explore global values, vices, and conflict. Hopefully, these photographers will be inspirational to you as you conceptualize your own narrative projects.